Love what you hear? Be sure to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight for exclusive episodes, insights, and even our D&D adventure. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today, we're going back to one of the classic indie titles that really launched the indie gaming genre, I guess if you want to call it that, in and of itself. I mean, along with Braid and various others of the time, we see them in a couple of different documentaries. And today, we're going to be talking about Super Meat Boy. Super Meat Boy was super weird. I mean, when it came out, it's not the protagonist that I think that you would expect in a video game around the time that it came out. And that's sort of, sort of where I felt like it started to break barriers. We're more comfortable getting into these really super silly games, sort of reminiscent of like internet flash games and things like that. Yeah, and that's very much what it was. It started on Flash and then eventually was like, hey, why don't we break out of this idea of funny junk and e-bombs world and all these ideas of having these flash games up there and let's bring them to consoles. Let's bring them to PC launches. And I know that uh, Edmund McMillan did the same thing with Binding of Isaac of starting with a flash game, building a full leaf fleshed game. I guess you want to call it that afterwards, the various expansions, but let's dive into his first kind of property he worked with under team meat. Super Meat Boy is a 2010 platform game designed by Edmund McMillan and Tommy Refines under the collective name of Team Meat. It was self-published as the successor to Meat Boy, a 2008 Flash game designed by McMillan and Jonathan McEnty. In the game, the player controls Meat Boy, a red cube-shaped character, as he attempts to rescue his girlfriend, Bandage Girl, from the game's antagonist, Dr. Fetus. The gameplay is characterized by fine control and split-second timing, as the player runs and jumps through over 300 hazardous levels while avoiding obstacles. The game also supports the creation of player-created levels. Super Meat Boy was first released on the Xbox 360 through Xbox Live Arcade in October 2010, and was later ported to Microsoft Windows, OS X, Linux, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, Wii U, and the Nintendo Switch. Development of the game began in early 2009. McMillan worked on level design and artwork, while Refinus coded it. The game's soundtrack was written by Danny Baranowski, who had also worked on the original Meat Boy. Super Meat Boy won several awards and has been cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. Critics lauded the game's controls, artwork, soundtrack, and challenging gameplay. The game was also a commercial success, selling over a million copies by January 2012. A sequel, Super Meat Boy Forever, was released on December 23rd, 2020, without McMillan's involvement. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the studio and its founders. Edmund McMillan was born on March 2nd, 1980, to a family of born-again Christians of Mexican descent. A lifelong resident of Watsonville in Santa Cruz, California, he attended Soquel High School. He's fond of drawing, his favorite subject being monsters. McMillan spent most of his childhood with his grandmother, whom he considers to be the greatest source of support in his creative endeavors. Later in his life, McMillan received a box from his grandmother that contained all of his drawings as a child. Many of these drawings can be seen by unlocking the box in one of his games, The Basement Collection. His childhood represents his own game creations, more specifically The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. In an interview with indie game The Movie, he explains that his family was consistently riddled with alcohol and drug addiction. He was confronted by this extreme faith, which caused him religious guilt and mental problems, causing him to grow a desire to fight back, resulting in his acting out against them. Tommy Refenis started at 72 DPI in August 2001, where he managed their website and servers. In August 2003, he was hired by Learning Station where he developed server software and applications in Flash, C++, PHP, and ASP. In July 2005, he decided to shift to the computer game field and went to work for Streamline Studios, where he assisted in optimizing and porting the Unreal 2 engine from the original Xbox to the Xbox 360. 
In May 2006, Rufinus and Aubrey Hesselgren, a game designer, founded the company Pillowford. Their first effort was a game they dubbed Goo. In 2008, Goo won the grand prize for best threaded game in the 2008 Intel Game Demo Contest and took third place for best game on Intel graphics. The game was canceled and Rufinus left the studio in January 2009. In 2009, he co-founded the company Team Meet with game and graphics designer Edmund McMillan, with Rufinus acting as programmer and co-CEO. Super Meat Boy is the only game they have published together as McMillan left Team Meet in 2017, and they are not expected to work on any more projects together. Though Team Meat did release Super Meat Boy Forever in 2020 with Rufinus as a designer and lead programmer, McMillan was not involved and later stated that he would not return to the series. Now, when it came to developing the game, the original Meat Boy is an Adobe Flash game created by Edmund McMillan, as we had said, and programmed by Jonathan McEntee. The game was developed over a three-week period and was released on Newgrounds on October 5th, 2008. By April 2009, it had garnered over 840,000 views at Newgrounds and 8 million overall. A map pack for the Flash version was released on December 8th, 2008. McMillan began development of Super Meat Boy after Nintendo and Microsoft requested that he make a game for their download service, WiiWare, and Xbox Live Arcade, as they were impressed by the success of his Flash games, Ether and Meat Boy. At the time, he was working with Tommy Refinez on a Flash game titled Grey Matter. Although Macmillan initially pitched the companies a sequel to Gish or Ether, the pair decided to form Team Meat and work on an expanded version of Meat Boy instead. Team Meat also includes soundtrack composer Danny Baranowski and sound effects designer Jordan Fair. According to the developers, Super Meat Boy is a big throwback to a lot of super hardcore NES classics like Ghosts and Goblins, Mega Man, and the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2 with the plot written as a mashup of every video game story from the early 90s. The game was explicitly designed by the team to be reminiscent of Super Mario Bros., and Macmillan considered it a tribute to Shigeru Miyamoto, the developer of Super Mario Bros. Macmillan worked on level design and artwork, while Refinez coded the game. It was tested primarily by the pairs and their families. Macmillan and Refinez lived on opposite sides of the United States, and met only a few times in person while working on the game. They developed the control scheme by iterating through several designs, trying to find one that felt fluid and logical. Rather than use a pre-built game engine, Refinesse programmed an original one. The game was initially set to include around 100 levels and to have cooperative and competitive multiplayer modes. During development, however, the multiplayer option was dropped and the number of levels was greatly increased. The pair designed the game to be deliberately retro, imitating the aesthetics of traditional platform games, but with a modern sensibility regarding difficulty. They wanted the game to be rewarding and challenging rather than frustrating. To this end, they included infinite lives, quick restarts of levels, obvious goals, and short levels they felt the replay feature transformed death into a form of reward. Development of Super Meat Boy began in January 2009. Initially announced for WiiWare and PC, the game was set to be released in the first quarter of 2010. The release date was pushed back to the fourth quarter because the developers wanted more time to create extra levels, such as the Dark Worlds. A picture released on Team Meat's Twitter page on February 22nd of 2010 revealed that the game would also be released for Xbox Live Arcade. The next day, they announced that while all versions would be released in the same month, the game would be released for the arcade first due to contractual obligations. In August 2010, the developers were contacted by Microsoft with the prospect of inclusion in Microsoft's 2010 Fall Game Feast Xbox Live Arcade promotion two months later. As they were almost out of money, they did not believe that they could financially support themselves until the spring event, but felt they had four months' worth of work left to complete on the game. For the final two months of development, they worked daily, slept five hours a night, and frequently forgot to eat, 
a process that McMillan said he would never voluntarily go through again. According to McMillan, due to Microsoft's low expectations for the game, Super Meat Boy was lightly promoted. The level of promotion was not increased during the game feast, though the game greatly outsold the rest of the games in the event. The team described the effort required to finish the game for the promotion as by far the biggest mistake they made during SMB's development. Their development struggle is depicted in the documentary Indie Game The Movie. The game was released on Xbox Live Arcade in October 2010 and on PCs via Steam and Direct to Drive a month later. McMillan noted that the PC release was more heavily promoted than the Xbox Live Arcade version. A version for Mac OS X was released in November of 2011, while another version for Linux operating systems was released in December 2011 as part of the Humble Indie Bundle No. 4 Game Pack. Due to Sony's initial lack of interest in the game, Team Meat entered into contractual obligations that prohibited Super Meat Boy from ever being released on the PlayStation 3. Despite this, a version for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita was eventually announced. The WiiWare version was cancelled because the game's file size had been expanded beyond the limits imposed by Nintendo. Team Meat looked into releasing it as a retail Wii game, but were told by all third-party publishers they approached that a budget title would not be profitable so late into the Wii's life cycle. Versions of the game were eventually released for Nintendo's follow-up systems, Wii U, and the Switch. The Switch version includes a platform-exclusive race mode, allowing two players on the Switch's split screen and using separate Joy-Cons to race through sets of levels. This mode was added to the Windows version in October of 2018. A limited edition retail version of the PC game was released in April 2011. It included bonuses such as behind-the-scenes videos, a sample disc of the game's music, and a Super Meat Boy comic. In 2012, Team Meat began prototyping an iOS and Android version of the game. The game was intended to be a different take on the Super Meat Boy concept that is more adapted to touchscreen controls than a direct port would be. This project would develop into the new Endless Runner game Super Meat Boy Forever, revealed in 2014 at the video game convention PAX. Team Meat released several pieces of merchandise related to Super Meat Boy. These included Super Meat Boy Handheld, an iOS app released on April 3rd, 2010, and styled on a Tiger Electronics handheld. It was released as a joke after Refines' game, Zits and Giggles, was removed from the iTunes store following a statement by Refines that likened the iPhone to a Tiger handheld. McMillan has released a Super Meat Boy micro game for WarriorWare DIY, and Team Meat sells charms, plush toys, and posters related to the game, as well as t-shirts, stickers, stress balls, and a limited edition Super Meat Boy comic. In 2011, Voxlius released a set of four Super Meat Boy figures of Meat Boy, Bandage Girl, Brownie, and Tofu Boy, later making figures of Commander Video, Jill, Agmo, and Dr. Vetus. Super Meat Boy is a platform game in which players control a small, dark red, cube-shaped character named Meat Boy, who must save his cube-shaped, heavily bandaged girlfriend, Bandage Girl, from the evil scientist, Dr. Fetus. The game is divided into chapters, which together contain over 300 levels. Players attempt to reach the end of each level, represented by Bandage Girl, while avoiding crumbling blocks, saw blades, and various other fatal obstacles. The player can jump and run on platforms, and can jump off or slide down walls. The core gameplay requires fine control and split-second timing, and was compared to, regarding both gameplay and level of difficulty, traditional platform games such as Super Mario Bros. and Ghosts and Goblins. Levels in each chapter can be played in any order, but a certain number of levels need to be completed to access the boss stage, which unlocks the next chapter if cleared. The player has an unlimited number of attempts to complete each level. If Meat Boy is killed, he immediately restarts the level, though the ornamental red meat juice left behind on surfaces that the player has touched remains. A replay function, which may be accessed after a level is completed, simultaneously shows all the player's attempts to complete the level. Completing a level within a certain time earns an a grade, which unlocks a harder alternate version of the level in the Dark World, an optional set of especially difficult levels. 
Hidden stages called warp zones are accessed by finding portals in specific levels. These warp zones feature bonus levels that have either the art style of older video games and a limit of three lives, or are patterned after another indie video game such as Castle Crashers or Braid. The player may control characters other than Meat Boy, many of whom first appeared in other independent video games. Each character has different attributes, such as Commander Video's ability to momentarily float in midair. These characters can be unlocked by collecting bandage items placed throughout the game's levels or completing certain warp zones. Some bandages can only be collected by using certain characters. Some levels, such as warp zones and boss levels, can only be played with specific characters. The available characters vary depending on the version of the game played. The Xbox Live Arcade version features an unlockable mode called To Internets, which is updated with new, free, officially curated levels. The PC version has a Super Meat World section, which allows users to play and rate additional levels that players have created with a level editor. This editor was released in May 2011. Players can also access an unsupported developer mode inside the game to edit their own levels using the rough tools that Team Meat used to create the game. Now, I know you've all been salivating for the story of Meat Boy, so let me tell you about it. It's riveting. Meat Boy lives with his girlfriend, Bandage Girl. One day, Bandage Girl is kidnapped by Dr. Fetus, an intelligent fetus in a life support suit. Meat Boy then goes after Fetus, until Fetus burns down the forest and tries to kill Meat Boy in his little slugger, which is destroyed after Meat Boy tricks him into running into a bunch of saws. Fetus escapes to an abandoned hospital, where Fetus unleashes Chad, a giant monster made of blood. Meat Boy shows the sun to the monster and redeems him, but then goes after Fetus, who goes to his salt factory. There, a clone of Meat Boy made of feces called Brownie is created, leading to a race between the two, presumably killing Brownie. Fetus goes to hell, where Meat Boy discovers that every time he dies, his corpse goes to hell. Little Horn, a Meat Boy-esque monster made up of those corpses, attacks Meat Boy. Fetus escapes and triggers a nuke, which opens a path to the top of the world. Meat Boy is lured to fight Laris Lament. Three Worms Who Inspired the Larry Jr. Boss from the Binding of Isaac. In the final level, Dr. Fetus runs after Meat Boy, who destroys the bridge he is on, destroying Fetus' life support system. Fetus tries to kill Meat Boy and Bandage Girl by blowing up his facility, but Brownie appears and saves the two while sacrificing himself. As Bandage Girl hugs Meat Boy after escaping, Fetus suddenly lands on Bandage Girl and tries to pummel her as the game cuts to credits. If Dr. Fetus is beaten in the Dark World, it is shown that Fetus's attacks were ineffective and Bandage Girl proceeds to stomp on him. What a twist. What a twist, they might say. (laughs) Now let's talk about usually the best part of the episode, the music and sound. Super Meat Boy's soundtrack was composed by Danny Baranowski, who previously composed the soundtracks for the indie video games Cannabalt, Cortex Command, and Gravity Hook. He also composed the music for the original Meat Boy. McMillan knew of Baranowski's other work and approached him late in Meat Boy's development, asking him to supply whatever tracks he had on hand. For the soundtrack of Super Meat Boy, Baranowski incorporated the music he had provided for Meat Boy into an expanded soundtrack. He tried to ensure that the music would accompany the action on the screen without overpowering the sound effects. Baranowski was given complete freedom for the game's music and retained all of the rights to it. McMillan believed that being more invested in the game would let Baranowski express the part of him that was manic, obsessive, complex, and full of life. McMillan feels that the soundtrack, quote, gets your heart rate up, complements every aspect of its gameplay, and stays with you for days. On October 26, 2010, the game's soundtrack was released as a download-only album via the online Bandcamp store titled Super Meat Boy Soundtrack. This release features 34 tracks and a 100-minute runtime and includes several remixes of tracks from the game. On January 11, 2011, Baranowski and Team Meat released a special edition soundtrack 
on Bandcamp as both a downloadable and physical album. This edition includes a second disc of songs not included in the original release, as well as additional remixes. The album, titled Nice to Meet You, ha, has a total of 73 tracks, is 2 hours 25 minutes long, and features album artwork by Macmillan. Three music tracks from the game were released as downloadable content for Rock Band 3 in June 2011. Baranowski's music was not used for the PlayStation 4, Nintendo Wii U, Nintendo Switch, and PlayStation Vita versions, as he, quote, no longer had a working relationship with Team Meat, and they could not agree on licensing terms. Instead, those versions of the game feature a soundtrack composed by Ridiculon, who is Matthias Bossy and John Evans, as well as David Scaddle, Scatliff, and Laura Shigihara, who have previously worked on games such as The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, Hotline Miami, and Plants vs. Zombies, respectively. A soundtrack album for the new music, titled Songs in the Key of Meat, music from SMB 5th Anniversary, was released on Bandcamp on October 6, 2015. On April 13, 2017, Tommy Rafenis introduced the alternative soundtrack on the PC port. So, a little tricky in there, with little fallouts all across Team Meat, but Let's talk about what the critics thought of it, because that's, that's what we all care about, isn't it? we got to see the numbers tick up. If I mean, they're not good numbers, we're not good by. <laughs> the meat spoiled, but will the reviewers? That's what they say it Bam. all the time. Bam. <laughs> Bam. So as we know, we said at the top of the episode, Super Meat Boy received critical acclaim. After being showcased at the Penny Arcade Expo, or PAX, 2010, Super Meat Boy was declared Game of the Show by Destructoid and nominated for the same award by Machinima.com. The game received nominations for the Grand Prize and Excellence in Audio Awards at the 2010 Independent Games Festival. It won the award for Most Challenging Game in IGN's Best of 2010 Awards and received nominations for Best Soundtrack and Best Retro Design. It was voted GameSpot's Best Downloadable Console Game of 2010 and won the Best Downloadable Game Award from Game Trailers. Sales were strong, with nearly 140,000 units of the Xbox 360 version sold by the end of 2010. The Steam and Xbox 360 versions had sold over 600,000 copies combined by April 2011, and 400,000 of those sales were through Steam. On January 3rd, 2012, Team Meat announced on Twitter that the game had surpassed 1 million sales. Critics praised Super Meat Boy's platforming elements and often commented on the game's difficulty. X-Player reviewer Alexandra Hall said the game had riveting platform action and added that Super Meat Boy's designers are masters of their craft. Henry Gilbert of Games Radar felt the platforming was perfect. He wrote that, while it's always tough and demanding, it never feels cheap or like the game is cheating you. A reviewer from Game Trailers stated that the difficulty rides the perfect line between driving you utterly bonkers when you fail and making you feel like a platform pro when you succeed. Joystick's Richard Mitchell echoed other reviewers' comments, quote, Super Meat Boy is tough, as tough as the toughest nails in the toughest universe. Gilbert cited the level of difficulty which he believed made the game inaccessible to some players as his reason for not awarding the game a perfect score. Tom McShay of GameSpot praised the game's precise control, excellent level design, and smooth difficulty curve. Reviewer Tom Bramwell of Eurogamer warned that Super Meat Boy is a hard game. It should make you want to throw the pad across the room. Critics gave high marks to the game's retro art direction and presentation. Official Xbox Magazine UK's Mike Channel appreciated the variety found in each set of levels. He stated that while the graphics may look crude, the presentation is exceptional. Each level has a distinct visual style. Damon Hatfield, a reviewer for IGN, noted the uniqueness of the game's visual presentation. He commented that the Warp Zone levels pay tribute to classic 8-bit games and lauded the game's soundtrack. Quote, The rocking chiptune soundtrack is the best I've heard since Scott Pilgrim vs. The World the game. Joe Leonard of 1UP.com noted that the game's humor and over-the-top gameplay helped to calm frustrations regarding the difficulty, quote, 
Super Meat Boy's greatest strength has to be how it never takes itself too seriously. As maddening as some of the levels got, I can never stay angry at the game for too long. MTV multiplayer reviewer Russ Frushtick praised the game's visual design. He appreciated the game's cutscenes, which he noted are hand-drawn animated shorts, which bear more than a passing resemblance to a classic video game intro. While the game received high praise overall, certain publications voiced complaints. Hatfield noted that the cutscenes had low production values, stating that they don't have the polish of the rest of the game. The reviewer for PC Gamer mentioned a few minor yet-to-be-patched bugs. Eduardo Robuscus of Game Revolution said that a lot of the levels in Super Meat Boy depend a little too much on Twitch reflexes and trial and error memorization. He also stated that there are some bits of toilet humor here and there that are duds, and that the game's high level of difficulty will make most casual players shy away. Mitchell Dyer of GamePro agreed, saying that certain absurdly difficult levels broke the flow of the game, especially in the boss levels and the later chapters. Now, all that aside, we do see our little fun little red cube in a lot of other games. Meat Boy has made cameo appearances in the video games Bit.Trip Runner, Bit.Trip Fate, and Bit.Trip Presents Runner 2, Future Legend of Rhythm Alien, as well as in Spelunky, Dust in Elysian Tale, Ori in the Blind Forest, Retro City Rampage, Io Mio, and Indie Pogo. A parody Flash game, Super Tofu Boy, was released by People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, on December 1st, 2010, to protest the game and promote veganism. In response, Team Meat added its own interpretation of Tofu Boy to the PC version of the actual Super Meat Boy on December 2nd, 2010. The game's success spurred the development of the 1930s-style animated indie video game Cuphead. On August 29th, 2014, Team Meat announced that a sequel, Super Meat Boy Forever, was in development for smartphones, tablets, and Steam. The game would remain in development hell until the project was restarted in 2017 without the assistance of Macmillan. In August 2017, the game was confirmed for release for Microsoft Windows, Nintendo Switch, PS4, Xbox One, iOS, and Android systems. The Switch and Windows versions were released in December 2020, with other platforms following in 2021. We get a little bit more Meat Boy later in the days and coming to all of our systems, not just iOS, but it is one of those that no matter what you think of this as, you know, a retro-inspired platformer that we see, you know, inspire a lot of other games that come out, like Celeste, that are ramping up this difficulty in these indie games. And I think that begs kind of the question or kind of the idea of that love-hate relationship that gamers have with difficulty. You know, you could have a triple A or double A, whatever you want to call um, the studio, when you're producing stuff like Dark Souls. Um, that is that like love hate of like this is insanely hard, but you get that that rush when you beat a boss that you've been on for a while, or games like Celeste, or like getting over it, or anything like that, where it's like like getting over it is insanely hard and ridiculous and is near impossible to do unless you're that insane speedrunner who did it in like 12 seconds and just launched up it, but playing it casually. It's just dumb. And we see even more iterations of those games come out that are kind of these like hate holes of like you get to a certain point and then you fall or die. And it's just insanely hard. And Meat Boy is kind of one of those first in more modern times to like put that challenge out of feeling that medium difficulty between being too hard, but then also feeling that you conquered it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that video games have gotten easier over time. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is just because like playability and controls have just gotten more sophisticated in that sense. And I think that the design ideas, I have to imagine, were always made with considerations to approachability to a game. Like, There's not too many people, I think, that set out to say deliberately, hey, we're going to make this game super hard. But like, when you think about the original Super Mario Brothers for NES, you know, there's the Lost Levels. And the Lost Levels were these, originally, these Japanese exclusive levels that were basically deemed too hard for Western audiences. And 
you know, when you think about that, I think in video games and, and how they approach difficulty levels like that, you get a game like Super Meat Boy, which is more emblematic, I think, of the lost levels and basically giving people that chance to, you know, have this type of difficulty level. Because I think games like Super Meat Boy have been available in a lot of forms and especially the Super Mario Brothers series. Um, but there's a lot of Super Mario Brothers levels and games that are just not that difficult. I was just talking to you about this. I just finished Super Mario Wonder a little bit ago, and I didn't think that that game was difficult at all. Um, to the point to where I was just like flat out disappointed by the time that I was done because I flew through all of those levels and and there was like quirky little fun things with the the wonder flowers and things like that. But in terms of like getting that rush you were talking about about finally conquering a difficult video game. I definitely didn't get that from Super Mario Brothers Wonder. And thinking back to like when this game came out was that era of the new Super Mario Brothers. And that game was a little harder, I think, than Wonder, but not by a lot. And they definitely, in my opinion, were not nearly as difficult as the original NES Super Mario Brothers. And so games like this, I think, are sort of a refreshing take on video games because it is more emblematic of that past where it is that hard difficulty that I think is more for people that I think are just experienced and getting a little fatigued of playing the similar games with the same easy run throughs, you know, and they're looking for that extra challenge. Yeah. And, and we're not talking about impossible challenge, like the Lion King game or the <laughs> Aladdin game or literally anything Disney sure. put out in the nineties. Sure. Nothing like that. But you do see that same thing bringing up Mario. You know, you've got a huge community that works in Mario Maker, but also in uh, some ROM hacks called Kaizo Mario. Uh, Kaizo Mario World is the whole thing. And a lot of that was like taking these ideas of classic Mario levels, flipping them on their head, making them like, quote unquote, near impossible, but based on, you know, amazing runners of these games that can hit those like precise jumps. And they know to like do like a shell jump to a dash to jump on this thing, to slide under this thing. And it's so amazing to see those people play those games at such an elite level. And it's because people do clamber like, hey, I, I like Mario, but I've played it. I beat the original game in four minutes. Like, what else can I do to really enjoy the idea of platforming and, and make it something that's fun that doesn't have to be like an insanely modern way of doing it? Give me a 2D side scroller, but make it a challenge in this way. And that's kind of what Super Meat Boy was doing with that, where it, it is making that challenge of like, hey, you got to make that precise jump around the saws. Otherwise, you're going to see your meat juices <laughs> flying everywhere every time you die. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's, trying, it's trying to bridge that gap because I, I, I think there's plenty of games out there that could be cozy and fun. And we have those. So I don't think you have to make a game like Mario Wonder, which is definitely trying to target a new audience and bring people in. But you can still give a little bit of difficulty to it. You can still give a little challenge that isn't just basically like, oh, I'm just walking through these levels. Like, there's nothing much for me to do. As someone that has played it from the beginning, you know, to me, I play that kind of game, and, and I know right away, like, hey, this is not... I don't think I'm the audience for this. Whereas, you know, Super Meat Boy is definitely more up my alley in terms of that. And, yeah, that memorization thing where that can be frustrating i think growing up playing old school style video games makes me a little bit more okay with that style of gameplay just because that was video games for a really long time just fail do it again sure. get the muscle memory then you'll beat it you know it's it's how coin-based arcade systems were for a long time it's how I think a lot of the first home console games were. And so this game to me, you know, it, it gets some criticism for that. But then I think to myself, well, you know, if you're looking sure. for something easier, it's not like Meat Boy specifically is so groundbreaking that you're not going to get a similar experience in something else. Like, yeah, the, the aesthetic is different and, and maybe you're just tired of seeing Mario's face. But go play Mario, you know, is, is my thought. If you're if this is too hard for you, like you can go play Mario and get the same feel. Yeah, and, and so I want to take this time to kind of address like play whatever games you want, but give that challenge to 
or at least allow that challenge in your game. And I think that's kind of want to bring up with that is allow me to be able to be challenged in it. Even if it's going to be something that is, yeah. some people may, may wish we'll play it casual. And we do see that there's we, a lot of AAA titles uh, made like a movie mode or like a, like a, I want to experience the story mode. And that's where like, there's really no difficulty. You just want to see the whole story. You would like to get the cut scenes. You'd like to have those options but they do add those, those tougher modes in. And I, I think that was something that games struggled with for a long time was, okay, does making a game harder just mean more health and less attack damage? Or does it mean more of a challenge overall in the gameplay? Does it mean less resources? I think so much of that has evolved and devolved really uh, over time into what people actually want. And I think, I, yeah. Right. No, and, and I, I think some of that falls to the wayside when it comes to, and we're not, I'm not going to go on a whole tangent with this, but when microtransactions and kind of milking the proverbial gaming cow came in, instead of like trying to go for the challenge to unlock the skin for this character, you're going to have to buy it for $10. So I think a lot of like what was in, in games of the past were like, you could do these challenges, you can get the achievement to do it, you can get these things in there, is now a $10 cash grab. For sure. No, that's definitely a very valid point because I, I think about like the getting the Hayabusa in Halo 3. Like that was something that, mm-hmm. you know, you needed to actually put some effort into to get. And then it was this, you know, display of pride. And Super Meat Boy, you know, maybe back then the pride was just the achievement on your Xbox Live profile, something like that. But, you know, that's still like a, a little badge of honor, especially when when achievements had really just come out. and. I think that people were a little more invested in them. But I I definitely think having games available that are approachable for people is definitely important. Having those theater modes like you're talking about, I I think that's great and amazing because there are people who are new to video games or just aren't that good at video games. Like you and I have played video games like our whole lives, basically. And so if we play a video game with someone who really doesn't play all that much, but we don't want to exclude them. We also don't want it to like for there to be such a disparity in like the ability needed to play the game that they just flat out can't play with us or something like that. You know, we want them to be included. Yep. But you know, games like super meat boy existing as that single player, you know, that little extra thing that you need to get to get a challenging level out of your system. You know, I don't think you'd want to necessarily go and play through Super Meat Boy all in one run unless you're a sadist. But like getting getting a few levels out, like and then, you know, chilling and True. going and playing a few more levels again later. Like that's a really satisfying game, I think, compared to doing the same thing and Mario Brothers, Wonder, New Super, or any of those. Yeah, and and so I mean, you guys already kind of know what we chose. This kind of like one of the grandfathers of of modern indie titles, or or some of the ones that paved the way of the, you know, <laughs> five hours of sleep, don't eat kind of schedule. Uh, oh, you know, a lot of that was just us. Most of the oh. way, <laughs> does that? Yeah, just us. Um, no, we paved the way for you. But you know, there's so many different options with like Steam Greenlight. Um, you know, doing some of these like beta programs that Steam has, that Xbox has, that you can kind of get in that are kind of these pre-releases that some people do abuse, but for the most part, it allows a lot of these indie devs to gauge the interest in it. You know, you can have that early access and it allowed so much more for people to get into these assets too, because at the time there weren't that many like true assets available for people to use to create these games. Like you got to use a lot of this like major studio software, build your own engine, basically. Um, Whereas now, you know, you have Unity and you have Unreal and you have a a bunch of other different engines that you can use to kind of platform your game on uh, to create these style of games from it. So it's it's very cool. I think as we wrap up, Derek, let the people know, what would you give this game? Yeah, I think that this game for me is like an 8 out of 10 um, because I, I do love platformer games like this. I think that they're fantastic, and I think everybody should play Super Meat Boy. Uh, The graphics are a little rough for me, even for, like, an indie title. Like, I get it. It, But it is so, like, bare bones to, like, functionality that there's not a lot of difference to me looking at this game and exactly what you would get in, like, a really cheap 
you know, flash game on the internet. Sure. So that that bumps it down for me just a little bit. But, you know, overall, a lot of fun. Love Super Meat Boy. What about you? Yeah, I think that's it. exactly it. Like, it's it started off the trend of just so many different styles of games out there to expand upon. Um, there's so many different 2D scrollers that took those ideas and built upon it. Again, coming from that, like you said, bridging the Flash era to kind of like modern indie era. This was the weird period, because I even see that in Castle Crashers. I love Castle Crashers, but you can see that as like, ooh, it's one step, maybe two steps above that Flash game. Yeah. Kind of like a, pa- a paid version of it in a way. Yeah. And so as those games expanded out, like they're still beloved. I absolutely love these games, but I can definitely see where you're coming from with that. So if I had to give it a rating, I would give it getting all three meat cubes in the Binding of Isaac so you have a meat boy to walk around with you. And then as that meat boy evolves and fight the bosses for you, it's fantastic. Then getting Dr. Fetus, which is also another item you can get where you can drop bombs. Another great item. It's a great run winner, not a run killer. Um, and then out of all of that, um, you know, looking out for Larry. He's great. He's a, not a fun boss, but he's fine in the Binding of Isaac. I played a lot more of that than did Meat Boy. I think I have like 400 hours in the Binding of Isaac. Um, out of 10. Yeah, and counting. And counting. <laughs> <laughs> out, out of, of what? It's just a, you know, just a, just a round, a round number. Out of, out yeah. of ten. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, the um, the indie thing, like at the top of the episode, just talking about like getting comfortable with the sort of the silliness. I just felt like, you know, we had like Crash Bandicoot and you know, like Jack and Daxter and like these like goofy protagonists for such a long time, you know, and then we got away from that and everyone's like, oh, I'm super tough. That's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be Master Chief. I'm going to be Marcus Phoenix. I'm going to be like all these BA people, well, yeah, yeah. you know, and then it's like, okay, well, there's still that, that, that little group of people though that want that silliness and like super meat boy then well yeah because it, it, it's you know meat boys coming out in the era of the browns and the grays and the sludge and the sad backstories of apocalypses and wars and then you got meat boy and you got these other indie titles that were bright and you know bray didn't have a, a very happy story with it but it still came out in like a very colorful era and in a very beautiful era with all of these things and it's so cool to see all of that kind of pushing against. And that's really why indie games came out. I want to make the game I want to play. I don't want to keep playing, you know, Sludge Finder 5000, where it's just grays and browns and goop. Like, I want to play something that I find interest in that I think is going to take off. And, you know, Xbox Live Arcade was one of the smartest moves Microsoft made, really in the gaming sphere, of, like, taking the hold of that, like, not allowing Sony to jump in. Like Nintendo kind of did it. And the Switch, they just went, hey, if it breathes, put it on the system. But with Xbox Live Arcade, <laughs> it was at least like greenlit. <laughs> you know, they would have like little festivals where people would test out demos. Anything that received really positive would, would make it onto that, it would basically get greenlit. And we see that, you know, again, following that into Steam. And so, yeah, it really paved that way. And I, you know, I find myself really only playing indies at this point. There's triple A's I'll play that'll come out and it's a game I want to play. I enjoy it. I have fun with it. But the games that bring me back are those indie games. It's the ones that are like, how do you challenge the status quo? How do you not be an FPS clone, a sports clone, you know, a, a heavily story-driven button mash game? How do you change out of that? And there's ways that so many of these games have taken the idea of what gaming is and shifted it. Even games like Jackbox Party Pack that is a totally indie developed game like that, that is more like, hey, we're a game, but we're a party game. Like we're using a video game platform to be this fun get together party game. Then you can jump over to Hades, you know, with Supergiant making such a fantastically beautiful roguelike story driven, just mm, delicious game that's getting a second release with it. And you have really indies are driving so much of this up. Is it bloated? Yes. Everyone wants to get their game out there. And you have to get very, very lucky or be purchased by Microsoft and then only make what their shareholders want and then do worse. You know, you have two options with it at this point. Yeah, and I think that gamers are more invested in the indie sphere because they really want successful games to come out of 
small studios rather than continue to pay for, I think, what is always like really solid content. And I mean, don't get me wrong, because I, I love me some AAA games too. I just think like as a whole, you really root for like the underdog game and people will follow, I think, those stories really closely, be more willing to give those games a chance. They're usually a little bit cheaper because they are a little bit like rough around mm-hmm. the edges. But some really neat ideas in there that if you were to put those into AAA games, people would be like, what on earth were you thinking? If you put a AAA game out with Super Meat Boy difficulty, you know, you'd have Elden Ring or Dark Souls or whatever. That might turn a lot of people off. Yeah. So I think that that indie space existing and definitely getting, I think, platformed huh, up by like Super Meat Boy is, uh, and, and games like it around that time, it made a very, made for a very interesting, like diverse gaming market today. Yeah, and, and like even talking about the diversity of people who play indie games, I think it's such a great pathway for people who aren't quote-unquote hardcore gamers or people who didn't traditionally play when they were younger and grow up with it. It allowed for so much more diversity in those games. Farming sims, you know, being one of the biggest ones following the pathways of Harvest Moon and, you know, becoming these huge games that brought people on. Terraria, Minecraft, I mean, both huge indie titles. Minecraft's the best selling game of all time, and it's an indie game, you know? So, so you have games like this that, that really have changed the sphere of, of you know, from t- 2008, 2010-ish on, I mean, fully changed the landscape of gaming from the people who play them to the companies that produce them to who gets involved with it. You know, you, you don't have to try and, and find a studio in Santa Monica or find a studio you know, in Montreal to go work at. You can kind of do this in your own house. And the other thing too, if you do want to get involved in this, we mentioned Humble Bundle in this episode. Humble Bundle is a great place that also sells software packages and asset packages. So if you're getting into indie development of games or trying to make an RPG or trying to make the next Terraria, they have some asset packages like that that allow people like such a lower barrier to entry versus kind of you know, at any other time point. And so it's very cool to see. And if you haven't watched, you know, the, the basically indie video game movie, um, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking in terms of like what a lot of these guys sacrifice to what we see now as like you said, like, Oh, Meat Boy is like just a flash game plus, but what it took to like actually code that from scratch at the time is insane. And it's, it's, it's a, it's, rough what they went through, but like really paved the way to where so many games are right now. Yeah. And I, I think that you can appreciate super meat boy more for having that backstory and, you know, really getting that good idea of uh, what I think an indie developed game really goes through, especially when like you're an indie developer looking to get that big support, Mm -hmm. you know, that's really reminiscent of, how a lot of video game companies started before they did put out all these AAA games that we see now. We've had plenty of episodes on like the dog days of video game companies in the nineties. Oh, yeah. And you know, you can still see that in modern times through the indie sphere. And so super fun, uh, super meat. Love it. Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall and Derek Baker. The intro and outro music was given to us by our friend, Evan Barr, and our lovely artwork was provided by Aaron Shattuck. Beautiful people, as well as those beautiful people over on our Patreon. You can check us out at patreon.com slash finish the fight. Want to thank a few select members today with Snide T-Bird, Nick Hyman, and Anthony Gooch. Thank you so much for your support. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, please drop us a review. It helps us out a lot, and we'd love to hear from you. If you're listening on Spotify, every episode has a Q&A. And if you go ahead and enter your answer into one of those, maybe your answer will get published on our episode. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You can also check us out over on Twitch. You can see me at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That is twitch.tv slash S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0. As well as Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. 
You can follow this podcast on Instagram or Twitter. We are also in Discord. It's free to join. Lots of channels there. Lots of things to talk about. New Halo. New Halo seasons. Mm -hmm. We can talk a little bit about that. Anyway, there is a link um, to join that Discord in the description below, and we'd love to see you there. And with that, this has been our coverage of Super Meat Boy. Are there any other indie titles you think we should choose? Are there any others that have shaped the way that you play gaming or you think that gaming has shifted around it? Let us know in all of our social channels, our discords, our Q&As, whatever you can reach out to us. We'll be sure to look into it. And as always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast.